Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Modern Web Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about a really cool technology that is uh, on everybody's minds. I feel like this topic comes up literally on every single Twitter thread that I read these days, but it is about Houdini. And uh, today, we are very lucky to have Surma, who is the developer relations person for Houdini here. here. Thanks and welcome. We also have Vitali, who is who's done just some really, really awesome, amazing projects uh, using Houdini. So super stoked to have him on board as well. And of course, Amy, who has uh, been an advocate of Houdini probably from the very get go. Um, and then uh, my name is Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Leet. And I will be one of your co-hosts today, as well as Rob Osell, who is um, an, another software engineer at this dot. So before we get started, I want to make sure everybody can follow everybody on the internet. If you're listening to this, you can continue the conversation on there. So Surma is Das Surma, D-A-S-S-U-R-M-A. And then we have uh, Vitali, who is at B as in boy, O-B-R-O-V, 1989. And then Amy is Amy, A-I-M-E-E, -E, underscore Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. And then Rob, you can find him at Rob, O-C-E-L-L. -L. So very cool. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started, Rob? I will let you kick off. Awesome questions. Sure. So um, the first thing that some people might be wondering, you know, when they come across this video is sort of what is Houdini? I, I mean, I remember there was an article in 2016 which said it was, you know, one of the most, uh, what was it exactly, fascinating things, uh, exciting developments in CSS you've never heard of. So, uh, Surma, why don't you give us an introduction, kind of what is Houdini and, you know, what is it aiming to do? Sure. So, as you said, the article is uh, two and a half years old and written by my colleague, uh, but it's still true because I feel like it's still somewhat flying under the radar. So, it is really a really novel, revolutionary thing within CSS. So Houdini is an effort and the name of a task force within the CSS working group, so the standards body that creates CSS. Um, and its goal is to expose the machinery of the CSS engine that every browser has. Different parts of it, so you can hook into different subsystems and basically, at a side effect, explain how already existing things work. So my canonical example here is like, if you look at linear gradients, which you can use as a background image, it's kind of interesting because usually you think of background image as an image. So you use the URL thing and you put in URL and you have the image as a background on one of your DOM elements. But now you can also use linear gradient and you get a linear gradient that is dynamically created at the moment that it's needed perfectly sized to the element size with the colors that you specify. And the question then kind of is, how does this work? The machinery probably originally only supported images. How is this image that is effectively is generated on the fly? And this is where one of the APIs, in this case, CSS Paint API, would come in and give new power to developers to basically implement their own linear gradients. And that's really powerful, because if you think about it, I think for the longest time, people were hoping and complaining and starring the issue on Chrome to get conic gradients, and it just wasn't implemented. And if we already had Houdini, it wouldn't have been a big deal because you can just use Houdini to implement your old conic gradient. It would be just almost as performant, if not just as performance, get the same effect, and even get all the performance benefits on the side. Like It would be prepared off the main thread. Your page wouldn't get slower, and you would get the same syntax that you can actually use. Um, and that's where basically the Houdini task force is going through the entirety of CSS, taking a look at things that seem magic, and then exposing the underlying machinery that we have uh, to developers to take care of, to, to give them use to these kind of bits. So I am. I have actually a couple of questions. I was like excited to come on here, not so much as a guest. <laughs> So I must ask you because uh, I have so many questions, um, and this stuff is moving so fast. So, and I felt like this would be a good time to bring this up before we go too deep. So, it also sounds like Houdini is also a way to kind of get the different browser vendors to try to agree upon different specs. So, um, 
I've like been giving a talk just about CSS and deep diving into browser internal. So can you kind of tell people who aren't familiar with it what the CSS object model is? And then it's also my understanding that like part of the task force, part of what you guys are doing is trying to um, trying to normalize this since different people are implementing this in different ways. So can you talk about that too? Yeah. Okay. So um, there are so lots of things in there. <laughs> Sorry. So, so like, no, yeah, no, two, two questions. What's the CSS object model, and then how are we going about normalizing it? The CSS object model is kind of kind of just now a thing with Houdini. It's one of one of the APIs that came about from the Houdini task force. It kind of has always been there as an assumption or like mentioned in the spec because when you use elements and style sheets, they kind of have to be turned into objects within the code and then get applied to each other, but never something that was actually specified and would be left up to the user agent how the actual detailed implementation goes. But in the way it is used, it there were obviously certain implications that all browsers had to share because to yield the same effect, they all had to do the similar or same calculations. And now Houdini is exposing those bits. So the CSS object model is basically the data structures that are used um, to store and handle and manipulate and process your style sheets. So basically, if you type in with four pixels, then this is to be turned into A. This is, this is a value, which probably consists of a number and a unit, and is applied to the property called with. And these things need to handle not only different units, but also entire calc expressions. So you suddenly have an entire expression tree, and the object model takes care of giving you the data structures that can do all of that. So now you can handle units, you can handle multiplication and addition of different units, and you can move these values around, and you can inspect them, and you can write JavaScript in a way that is not string, and you then have to go about and slice it up yourself, but you already get the browser already does the parsing, right? Every browser has to take in a, the, the, the string that is a calc expression and parse it and understand it. But if you want to do that in JavaScript and do some manipulation, why would you have to re-implement it when the browser already has it? And now with Houdini, that's get exposed under the name CSS object model. Um, so that's how you can get access to that. And you're completely right, as a side effect of exposing these underlying machinery bits, because they're now specced in Houdini specs, browsers have to align even more on processing all these different parts in the same way so that all these spe new specs also behave the same across all browsers. This is both obviously a good thing, but also a huge undertaking, which is why the, the up ramp on Houdini in different browsers has been somewhat slower than you may, might be used to from other specs because it actually goes into the low-level machinery. And if it doesn't line up from the get-go, the engineers have to go in and actually readjust their entire browser engine, which is not easy. Um, but it, it will definitely be worth the effort. Does it kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Great. So um, you know, despite the fact that Houdini is still, I mean, I guess, that's the question, first question is, Sermis, so can you kind of describe where we are in this process? I mean, we talked about how some of these articles are two years old, but I know a lot of these APIs, even at that point, were still quite immature. Can you kind of give us sort of a status update on where we are in the overall process of, of yeah. exposing some of these goals and these, and these hooks that you've been talking about? Absolutely. So um, yeah, I guess two and a half years ago when the article was written by Phil, it was, that was just at the inception of the new task force, like none of the APIs were implemented or even existed over spec. It was just like, we want to do this. This is like the rough overarching goal where let, let's figure this out. And now we're at a point where we have some implementations. We have a lot of specs. We have some signals of interest from other browsers. And we're slowly getting to a point where browsers are shipping stuff. So I, uh, I'm going to shamelessly plug my website here, which is ishoudiniready.com, where uh, I struggle and hopefully maintain an up-to-date table of where current browsers are on the timeline of shipping Houdini. So I have all the current specs and spec ideas listed there and all the browsers and where they are at. So since Chrome is kind of leading the the effort here with the entire Genie task force, we are kind of ahead with shipping or at least the APIs in Canary. I think the only one that is actually stable and instable is CSS Paint, which we're probably going to talk about a bit later. 
Um, but just recently, we have gotten more and more signals from both Firefox and Safari that um, they want to start working on other APIs. So um, Opera actually is also naturally just pulling in whatever Chrome ships because they're based on the same browser engine. So I think in the next release or two, they are going to get um, more of those in. Same for Samsung browser. Um, the only th browser we haven't had any signals from is Edge, but that's mostly because they're had just because the API don't, doesn't exist yet, there's not many sites that rely on it. So it's obviously a low priority, which I think is a fair assessment of the situation because they have higher priority APIs they need to work on. Um, so I'm pretty confident. I, I know personally that they are super interested in doing it. They just didn't put the manpower on it just yet, but I know that it's going to happen at some point. And, and when you're saying um, that some of these um, some of these browsers haven't given signals on some of these APIs or intends to implement them, uh, you know, in a, at a particular time frame, that's not to say that they're not participating in the task force, right? Like th this task force includes representatives from all these browsers. I that's a really oh. good point. It's something I should have said from the first time. Like the task force consists of members of all these browsers, and even some people who don't ship browsers, like people from IBM, um, HP, are also on that committee or on the task force, and try to make sure that what we are doing is actually usable for developers that are out there in the wild. Also, I think you have a mailing list when you discussing all these things, what's happening right now, and it's open, yeah? Yeah, so technically, as all W3C standards bodies, they're open, and everything is publicly accessible. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy to read through a protocol of a Houdini task force meeting, because it's bonkers. It took me about a year to get, get acquainted with the lingo and just know what is important information. It was just noise and learn how to read specs, because specs are weird. Uh, but it, I, I got there in the end. But technically, you can look all of this up. But the reason it is hard to follow that along, and that's why I did the website to make it more accessible to the normal web developer and not just browser engineers to keep up with what's actually going on, what's on the horizon, and what's next. So also on the page, I actually link to the proof that I have that certain that certain browsers gave a signal that they are intending to implement or just at least signaling interest. So if you're curious, you can just go there and hopefully keep it. If you find something is wrong, just tweet at me or open an issue on the repository for the website, and I'm very eager to keep that thing up to date. Awesome. So Vitaly, I you know as Summer was saying, some of these APIs we we have seen some of the support for them ship in Chrome and and maybe even some of the other browsers. So. I, I know, for example, you've played around with like custom properties APIs. I was kind of curious what what drew you to be interested in Houdini, and could you explain a little bit of kind of what you've played around with and how that process went for you? Okay, so <clears throat> for me, all these APIs looks really interesting, and I started to use Paint API because it was shipped uh, like the first one in Chrome this March, uh, starting from Chrome sixty five. So I played around with these and I go deeper with uh, custom properties because they are actively used in CSS Paint API and uh, then type at OM also because uh, in Chrome Canary I think it's still behind the flag uh, we have this uh, like a possibility to pass arguments to paint and we can register uh, custom properties with types like uh, not just strings but uh, uh, type of CSS values that could be parsed and animated, uh, what's the main scene for that. So, and uh, yeah, mostly f I played with Paint API and I'm looking forward for layout. <laughs> it also uh, feels like uh, pretty powerful, let's say. And as uh, Surma said before, there is really hard to find some information. Uh, not everything put in specs. Uh, so uh, I find myself to go deeper in Chrome Blink sources <laughs> to find what exactly exists, for example, in some Paint API worklet or somewhere. What can I use? Because um, for uh, APIs that realize on worklets, they have limited special JavaScript context without uh, 
timeouts, for example, and other asynchronous calls and all this stuff. And it's really hard to understand what is available there. Um, that's actually a really interesting point because I that's something I've been struggling with in terms of what to do because you're right. Um, there is not a lot of good documentation out there for the currently not stable APIs. And that's both intentional and sad at the same time. So on the one hand, it's intentional because all these APIs are um, potentially going to change to, in, to, in a drastic measure. So I don't want to make it seem, like we don't want to make it seem like they're stable and you can start working with this and shipping code. And then once it's stable, you're good to go because your code will most likely be broken by the time we ship something to stable. And so my currently my rule is that I'm only going to write proper articles for things that the API is stable enough on. So for CSS Paint and Type Gem, we have good documentation out there now in form of uh, articles on developersgoogle.com. But for the other ones like Layout, which just about landed in Canary, I think a month ago, um, there's practically nothing. But for the people that are really like into it and really want to look in into this kind of bleeding edge technology. Uh, I do maintain a repository uh, in the Google Chrome Labs organization on GitHub in the Houdini-samples repository, where everything that is runnable in Chrome basically has at least one sample, if not more. So there is a good amount of samples for custom layout. There is one, a couple for paint, for animation worklet, for properties and values. So all these things that are not shipped to stable, and even in Canary, they're behind a flag and don't have documentation. I still have samples for them. So if you are someone who wants to just play around, I give you code that works. And that's, for now, I think the best I can do. But the second we are basically going to an origin trial, or I know the spec has stabilized to a certain extent, um, you can be sure that I'm going to start writing articles because I'm so ex it, it's so hard for me to hold back because I really want to share this knowledge <laughs> out because it's so fun to talk about it. But there's just a certain responsibility of not making people commit to something that might just break. Same. Can we actually back up for a second for people who are not familiar? We've kind of talked about like the Paint API, um, CSS object model. Can you kind of talk about what workloads are? Worklets, yes. Um, I mean, it's a, there's actually a, a hierarchy of APIs within Houdini. So we have worklets at the very bottom. We have type to and custom properties one level above. And then we have the high-level APIs on top that make use of all these low-level building blocks to build awesome, basically. Um, I'm going to start with type to m and properties and values because they're easier to explain. So probably most people who've worked with CSS and kept up with CSS knows that know that there's uh, CSS variables, or as they actually called, custom properties, basically allowing you to use the dash dash and any name you choose and assign a value to it, and then use that value with the var function anywhere within your CSS. That API was conceived um, a while ago, and is pretty well supported, I think, at this point but is inherently string-based. So all that the var function does is look up the value and just do a string replacement. So there's no deeper understanding of what you're passing in. Is a length unit or a color or a, an angle in degrees? It's literally just string replacement. And so one ability that gets lost, for example, is you can't animate over your custom properties or catch an error early if you assign by accident a color to what is used as a length and it will just compile anyway, or will just run and then just fail at runtime, which is kind of sad. So this is where typed OM, typed object model, comes in, which does exactly that. You can now assign, no, that's actually wrong. This is where properties and values comes in, where you can assign types to your custom properties, saying like, OK, my dash dash background color is now actually a color. And that means the you will get an error in your console if you assign something that's not a color to it, and also get the ability to transition for example, on your own custom properties. You can also assign default values, whether it should be inherited or not. You get a lot of more power over how your custom properties behave. And type to M is the object model that we talked about earlier, the CSS OM exposed. So you can now look at your style sheets, look at the styles on your element, and then actually inspect them in a typed way, saying like, OK, width is a length. And then you will get an actual inspectable JSON object telling you it is four pixels plus 4% 4, 4 long or whatever. All these things are now for you to use instead of like parsing a string. 
And the third building block we have, and now I'm finally getting to your question, are worklets. And worklets um, have been a source of confusion because they sound similar to workers. And that is intentional because they are similar of workers, but they're also very different. Um, so worklets are workers in the sense that they are an isolated JavaScript scope and run independently. But the interesting bit about them is that they don't have what is, they don't have their own event loop. That might not mean a lot to some people, but what it means is like we can put JavaScript in a scope. It's just its little own container, and then the browser can decide where to run it. So it can attach it to the main thread, but it can also run it in a different thread. And running things not on the main thread is a really good idea because you need your main thread for smooth scrolling and for keeping your repaints fresh and making your apps really smooth. So the more you can move off to different threads better. And so the point is that you can put code for CSS paint or for animation work, whatever it does, in a worklet, and the browser can decide if it actually needs to run the main thread or not. And most of the time, we can actually move it to a different thread. It's not properly implemented for everything, I think. But basically, this is just performance that you will get for free at some point in the future, where all those Houdini code that you've written will run in a separate thread or could even be parallelized. For, so for example, as I said, CSS Paint allows you to generate, for example, background images with JavaScript on the fly. A, it's already a good thing to run that off the main thread, because that's just budget you can save. But what uh, Firefox with server is looking into, they are generating the background image for the next frame before the current frame is even shipped. So they can actually generate images ahead of time because it is an isolated scope. And that's just genius. <laughs> so um, that's why the concept of worklets is really great. It's, it has been reused in other APIs as well. So for example, the web audio um, web audio API is using worklets as well to process and generate audio with JavaScript instead of just using filters and sine waves. So you can just manipulate the raw data with JavaScript without blocking your main thread, which is great. Yeah. So. I think what's interesting because you know this is where the articles and videos, if you watch them, are really great to get that the, the visual look on it. But um, as somebody that was just sort of investigating this, is it is it it's kind of right? Is it right to understand that these worklets, they're not a super heady technical thing. They're really just the mechanism by which we can perform these custom actions in JavaScript, but call sort of call them from CSS, right? I mean, that's sort of like when you're talking about the paint API, you can say this background image, and you call, you basically say paint with a particular identifier. And that identifier is a, pre, a registered worklet that you know, kind of tells the browser that that's code to execute. Now, is that going to be similar like, in other APIs, or is that not? Like shaders in WebGL. <laughs> kind of. So I, I know what you're, what you're saying, but technically, that has nothing to do with worklets. So if you, if you have used the CSS paint API, what you do is you write a class that has a paint function. And that paint function will get called whenever that image needs to get painted, that CSS will use the background image. And you register that class under a name using the register paint function, I think. This technically could have been an API that you just have on your window object, window.css.registerPaint. And it would have worked the exact same way. We put it in a worklet so that we have the ability to move it around. So the worklet is really just a container, and any form of API theoretically could get exposed in there. As I said, Web Audio API is doing it, where they expose the stream of audio data that you want to process. CSS Paint is using it, where they just expose a class, and the browser can invoke it whenever it needs a function, uh, it needs a new image. Animation work is doing it on every frame to get updated positions for your elements. Um, that is the concept behind a worklet. It's just a container. In Houdini, they're just specific to CSS. And the paint parentheses thing is how they are hooked up, how the browser knows which one to communicate with. Great. Um, OK. So, As, so if we will come back to type of OM. Um, you spoke already about some simple types like lens, uh, pixels, and so on. But uh, we have in spec something more complex like images, URIs. Uh, so uh, I know they're still in development, but when we can expect them to be in Chrome, for example, and 
I I can't answer that honestly. I actually have I have to admit I haven't checked in on the the remaining bits of typed in. So something that you currently cannot do, I think, and I'm actually not 100 percent sure, is you can't register custom properties to be an image or a matrix. Um, so if you do that, it will still work. You can still use your custom property with an image or with a matrix in there, but you don't get the nice detailed access to the individual fields of the matrix, for example, or get the loading state of the image. Um, I'm guessing there's people working on it, but I definitely don't know when that will ship. But the nice thing is, as you say, like what the, the goal really is to get go through all of CSS and figure out what types exist and expose them all to users. So in the end, you should be able to inspect your entire style sheet in a typed way and be, make your JavaScript much less string-driven and much more actually structure-driven to control your page in a much more uh, in a much nicer way. And one thing when we started out on this, we implemented like a really quick and dirty version of type 2 and ran some benchmarks. We have basically taken some really animation-heavy sites, rewritten them or fixed them to use our hacky type to M version so that instead of like setting elements position with strings, we use the type to N and we had speed ups up to 50% or 80%. That is obviously a, a super extreme case where you have jobs running on every frame where these things really add up. But it's just nice to know that these are the kind of performance cases that are out there if you're an animator. Um, so type to M will be a really nice primitive in, in that territory. Also, people always asking like, why we need Houdini? What reason to use it? It's the main question. <laughs> oh, so so that I think is an easy one. I, it depends. I I think for me the super exciting bit is it future proofs Houdini so much. As I said, people wanted uh, the conic gradient. They didn't get it for a long, long time in Chrome. And if they had had to Houdini it wouldn't have mattered. They would have just dropped in like some off the shelf conic gradient CSS paint module and be done with it and would not have to pay a performance penalty for using that. Uh, something that I get really excited about is custom layout. So with custom paint, you put in a paint parentheses in your CSS, and you can now draw your own images. With custom layout, you can put layout parentheses on your display property and implement your own layouts. And that is much more mind-blowing than it sounds like at the start. So something I see a lot if you look at I want to say Pinterest, they have this really iconic masonry layout where elements are differently sized, and it just adds up. There's no real concept necessarily of columns or rows, but it just shuffles them together to fill the space. That is now something you could implement without doing it in like weird position absolute fashion with JavaScript, but it's actually a proper layout. And that's a really, really cool feeling to do. Another thing I'm looking forward to is a constraint-based layout, something that I think is actually pretty common on both iOS and Android, where instead you um, say, OK, this element is underneath the other element and in the middle, and this element is next to that element, and you just give that to the computer. It figures out what it actually means, which is absolutely amazing for responsive layouts as well. Um, we have subgrid, which people are super excited about, but it's not implemented. With custom layout, you can just do that and then continue your work. So I think Houdini has this massive um, potential to just future-proof the web for things that are not yet there, not yet thought of. And once they are, people can start using it without having to wait for browsers for this extra long turnaround of um, standardization and finding consensus. But we can actually just leapfrog people to start doing it now. There's obviously also the, the gain in performance in that, as I said, we can move stuff off thread. It is better APIs. It uses less overhead. Um, with Animation Worker, you can do more complex animations with less JavaScript and stuff that actually runs frame perfect, so you get higher fidelity. So that's basically the three main advantages. It's future proofing, it's performance, and it's higher fidelity. The thing that is kind of like cool about it for me is if you have developers who are of varying skill sets and you know you could potentially background images, someone who's more advanced would do that and then like kind of create an API for the company or um, if you have like a design system or something, kind of create an API for that and then other people can just use that API. Um, I think, so I was just making that comment, but then my question was, 
I think, um, sorry, I'm reading a comment in, in the thread. Um, so kind of my question there was, I believe it, it may or may not have been a talk that you gave, Sarma, but I'm kind of curious, are browsers or, or browser vendors going to kind of be looking at the community to see what they do with this and potentially implement anything that the community does if there's enough people using it? That's definitely in the spurt of the whole thing. Uh, if anyone know, like if you're familiar with the extensible web manifesto, where the they said the web should work in a way we expose low level primitives, let developers and the community build things and then observe the popular patterns and ship those natively to give a better sp speed up to what is actually used the most. So there's definitely the desire and the plan to let the Houdini ecosystem grow. And I've talked to people uh, and my colleagues how we can foster an ecosystem of off-the-shelf Houdini modules, which would be great to have. Um, and if those get super popular, I'm pretty sure that this CSS working group will look back at them and how to make them available natively. Considering they're already implemented in a CSS compatible fashion in JavaScript, standardization should go a lot faster, I would hope. But that's you know, me just having an idea. Um, it's obviously too early to put this whole theory to the test, considering there's literally one browser with the Paint API implemented. But I've already seen some, some genius use cases uh, that I would love to see on the web. And if it's only to just reduce the number of DOM nodes that most sites have. Um, but yeah, definitely going to, the, 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 the dream would be that that entire ecosystem is being observed and then the popular things get shipped in a browser. Cool. I, and sort of riffing off that, like, so for people that are watching that are either hearing about it for the first time or have been following it for a while, and they're like, this is really cool. Now, I'm not really one for reading specs. That's not really my style, I, you know, that kind of stuff. But like, what's useful? What does the task force look at? Like, are, are sample sites, are articles, are people just playing around and sharing what they do in code pens? Is that stuff that's like helpful for the task force when they're, you know, just trying to figure out what's uh, got good ergonomics. You know, is there a way for developers to give feedback? Kind of, how can people get involved? You know, not necessarily on the mailing list. So that's literally my job. I'm supposed to be the voice of developers within the standards group, and I'm supposed to uh, feed, give back out what the standards group says to me to developers. I'm basically the medium. So if you have any problems or you are questions, always come to me. I'm super happy to help with anything that has to do with Houdini. Um, Apologies. Uh, most useful thing for us right now is using it. Just build things. Uh, maybe something great comes out where we say, like, oh, this is actually something we should have in CSS. Or you find out that certain ergonomics or certain capabilities are missing in these APIs. And all of that is super good feedback for me. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can address every use case, because it just, you know, scope creep is a thing. And it's something that where we have to manage the manpower a lot. But we also have had use cases where people were trying to build something that looked really simple, but for some reason was really, really hard to build, even with the new Houdini APIs. And then we sat down and readjust the API and try to accommodate an, an obviously good and useful use case in the API design. Right. I, I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but have, have you all seen the CSS Houdini.rocks website by developer Vincent? If anybody is just sort of hearing this and is having trouble rubbing, uh, getting their head around it, that website is phenomenal for practical, actual code on-page examples of each of these APIs that are supported uh, usually in Chrome you know, and, and expanding to more browsers. So I don't know if anybody else has any uh, good links or places to point people to or has had experience with that site um, or any feedback on that. Yeah, definitely go to css-houdini.rocks, I think it is. Um, which currently mostly focuses on Paint API because that's the only thing that's really shipped. Um, but there's already some things that I've never thought of. So one example that um, they came up with, which I think was an absolutely brilliant idea, is to use CSS Paint not to generate a background image, but to generate a border image and make the borders look like hand-painted sketchy lines. So suddenly you have these boxes that look like they've just been sketched into your page, and it, and it just looks great. And you can if, if, and you can randomize them and just change the color or the stroke width. And all of it is just, it's just generated on demand. Um, that was a really, a really brilliant idea. So it's definitely worth having a browse on that one. 
Also, there is Houdini spellbook at houdini.glitch.me. It tries to cover all the APIs and so on. So pretty good resource. Awesome. So, you know, that's that's all really great sense of where we are. I mean, Sarma, I know you talked a lot about you know how we got here and kind of some of the things that we can play around with and and you know really invite people to experiment and play and share what you've come up with using these APIs. But is there anything that you guys are working on in the task force that might be coming up? Any other interesting APIs or extensions of existing ones or the fleshing out of of some that that you know are are coming up at all? So I have to admit, I missed the last face-to-face -face because my best friend dared to get married, which is absolutely unacceptable. But we are meeting next month in Lyon, in France, for TPAC. And that's probably going to be really good. And we're probably going to make some headway there. Um, I think we are currently mostly stabilizing custom layout API, because that's something that uh, Ian Kilpatrick, who is BF geek on Twitter, and is the team lead within Chrome of Houdini. So he basically oversees all the implementations of Houdini APIs. Um, and he's been trying to design an API in a way that is both not completely overwhelming for developers, but also flexible enough that it can be implemented in all browsers and also still remain useful, which sounds incredibly hard because it is incredibly hard. But he's actually done a really good job, as far as I can tell. Um, so that's the. That's the newest and most freshly specced API. So we're still trying to stabilize that one. We are also working on animation work on the spec side. So it's currently not that the standards body is coming up with new things, but mostly stabilizing the, the old ideas into proper specs, proper standards, with proper spec language, um, and discussing with all the browsers that they're actually still on board with the current iteration of the spec and that they agree that they can implement it, will implement it, and that all the details are in line, which is super tedious work because we have to think about all the little corner cases, and especially with layout. Layout is absolutely bonkers with floats that might come along and margins. Um, so we're mostly doing the, the adult work right now, the cleanup, the, 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 the fancy, fun, let's have crazy ideas part is sadly over for a while now. And I think we're also working on a CSS paint two, level, level two, I think it's called, uh, because some ideas that we had are, were punted um, to the next level, because sometimes you just want to keep it small for the first duration and then start iterating. And there were some ideas about better support for animations, for animation work. We have ideas for better support to handle user input, which the first uh, iteration would probably not support. So there's all these little things that have obvious use cases, but to just keep your head free, we said, let's not worry about this now. Do it the next time around. And that's kind of where we're currently at. And yeah, as a layout, it's probably the biggest one that we're working on. Well, awesome. Um, so, you know, time's been flying by talking about Houdini, honestly. It's such an interesting topic. But, uh, you know, I thought one of the things that maybe we could uh, sort of start to wrap up with is if there's anything particular that everybody's sort of excited for or looking forward to or just anything that they'd like to share about it. I mean, I know personally probably one of the things I'm going to do when we get off here is, is go play around with the layout API, enable that uh, custom flag. And, <laughs> You know, got a couple of ideas on on some interesting layouts, so probably going to play with that next. But uh, Amy, did you have anything particular that you're excited about? Uh, you know, about Houdini that uh, you know coming up or that you've played with? Like I said, I'm really excited about the Paint API um, because that's kind of the one that's more stable right now that I've been playing around with, and I think. Um, you know, what I said a minute ago about kind of enabling developers from different skill sets. So if you have someone a little bit more advanced and um, they code this up in JavaScript and then you have someone who's just learning CSS, like a designer or someone, um, they can just kind of use that as like an API that they can play that case. Awesome. And how about you, Vitaly? Um. Now I think I'm mostly waiting for image and URL types <laughs> because I can imagine that I can use, for example, some video in CSS Paint to make background videos with some effects or something. But yeah, they're still in development, so no luck for now. <laughs> That's it. 
Great. And, and Surma, I know, I mean, is there anything that you've forgotten to mention so far at this point that you want to um, point people I'm, to or get people I'm excited about? Even- as a teaser, I can say that I have written the article on animation worklet because we are super close to shipping it, um, which is incredibly exciting because it's, for me, it's like the last gap to catch up with native effects. Like if you want to build your own scroll bar, if you want to have super cool parallax effects that are really high fidelity, that's where animation worklet comes in and really going to shine. That's something I'm uh, really excited about to ship that. And of course, as a shameless self plug, I'm excited about my own Houdini talk at Chrome Dev Summit 2018 in November. So keep your eyes peeled for that one where I'll basically do the more structured, more slightly polished overview of where Houdini is at and where you can find things to look at. OK. Awesome. Well, thank you so much all for participating in this. It's it's kind of amazing because, you know, we have so many great people just sort of like working on different fragments and segments of Houdini. Um, I, you know, I was familiar with it before this podcast, but just listening, it's it's so big. Like I didn't realize it was so massive and uh, you know, even though uh, Vitali has showed me some of the really awesome projects he's done, and I've heard y'all talk about it, like the layers and layers and layers of, you know, how this is really going to change the global ecosystem is is pretty crazy, actually. So it's it's fun to watch. I just think it's super cool. I mean, kind of what got me excited about it is, you know, I come from more of a JavaScript background, and this kind of enables me to I don't know, it's like making CSS cool again for people who for people who more are on the like I like JavaScript and programming side of things. Um, you know, and we have so many people like, you know, they're writing CSS and JS now. So um it enables stuff like that for people who their interest is a little more on the JavaScript side. They can play around more and more with CSS now, which I just think is super cool. Yeah. And we can write even JS and CSS. And there is examples, and we you could receive specs for that. So oh, no. it's more yeah. interesting. Let's not start more Twitter wars. <laughs> okay, well, very good. You can follow Modern Web on Twitter. That's Modern D O T Web uh, for uh, any updates related to our upcoming podcasts that are happening. We're doing a really cool one with Stephanie, who is at Microsoft on Web Hint next week, which we're, we're super excited about. Um, and for some of the different links that you've heard people talk about uh, on this podcast, we are going to go ahead and post them in the show notes. And again, you can follow all these folks on Twitter. You can look at the show notes for their Twitter handles and continue the conversation there. Otherwise, we are so happy you joined and we hope to see you on the next Modern World podcast.